Now, joining me from the London Podcast Studios are three veterans of the golden age of podcasting. Uh, first up, uh, it's TV indie Goldwaller's Faraz Osman. Hello, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. As you know, TV and podcast indie, why not? Let's just say it. I've made some podcasts. Well, we'll talk about why that might be on the agenda I know. Uh, very soon. Uh, the US writers strikes over. Uh, is that going to affect anything in the UK? Well, I mean, everything's affecting telly right now, not in a good way. Um, so it's a, it's a good thing. It's done. Look, those guys needed a good deal. It's a great deal for them. Um, and I think it's it's good news all around. It's, it's nuts it's taken so long for them to get to the point that they were negotiating at the beginning. It's a bit like, it feels like they've wasted a lot of time getting there. Someone uh, was saying that it, actually if, if you're Netflix, it's helped you save some money when you've needed to save some cash. Well, I think two things. What's going to be interesting next is there's already a rumour that Netflix are going to raise prices. So there's already chat about that happening, which off the back of a number of price rises and you know crackdowns on password sharing suggests that they're becoming even more can I say hostile to their customers maybe but either way the question is going to be are they going to produce less because I mean I can't imagine Netflix are going to start cutting exec pay and uh, and shareholders rev dividends so I imagine that the additional cost of staffing is going to mean either less programs get made so ergo less people get employed so there, there is going to be an interesting knock-on effect to it um, but this, the syndication model is is dead. That's why all this conversation came up. It's just going to be a question. It's going to be a question now of how competitive we're going to be in the UK off the back of this, and are we going to become more of a more of an attractive place to to make these big budget dramas? Uh, and next to Faraz, we welcome back Chloe Straw from Trade Body Audio UK. Hi, Chloe. Um, Audio Production Awards on the horizon. What can we expect? Um, we can expect an exciting night on the South Bank <laughs> at the BFI, as usual, Matt. So, uh, no, I think the awards are something that we have grown a lot over the last couple of years since I joined Audio UK. Um, we're really proud of them. We're partnering with Audible again and with Amazon Music and Wondery on the Pay What You Can scheme to make it more accessible. Um, we had like a great suite of winners last year and I'm excited. I get no say in the judging. So <laughs> the judging's happening right now. I'm excited to see who's on the shortlist. Uh, and and next to Chloe, we've got City University and Spiritland's Brett Spencer. Uh, speaking of awards, uh, you're hosting a lot of British podcast award winners at the end of the month at City University. Uh, what's on their rider? <laughs> I'm not <be> telling. <laughs> yeah, we're doing an event on the 25th, so if you were at the podcast awards, uh, you'll know that most people didn't get a chance to speak. So this is a chance for some of the winners from last week to speak about their awards and how those podcasts were made and what made them successful and that's on the 25th and you can apply for tickets on the City University website. Uh, tickets are free and uh, there'll be sort of networking afterwards. Lovely. Um, well, uh, kind of a, a radio audio story uh, we want to touch on to start with. Uh, and this is something that was connected both to the British Podcast Awards and also uh, Pod News Live, which was an event last week. Um, and that was a story that I haven't seen reported anywhere but everybody wants to talk to me about. So if you can't talk about it on your own podcast, uh, where can you talk about it? Uh, this is news that uh, the super indie Sony Music, that's the old something else, is in the process of divesting the majority of its program contracts with the BBC. Now, Sony bought something else two years ago and is reported to be the BBC's biggest external audio partner, which is going to make something of a headache for a number of BBC networks as it attempts to keep radio shows on the air um, towards Christmas. So what we believe has happened is um, Sony have decided that they don't want to make a lot of shows they currently make for the BBC and we'll be handing those back. Uh, we reached out to Sony Music to ask them about this and they didn't have anything to tell us. Uh, we also reached out to the BBC who again didn't have anything to tell us uh, though I thought it was interesting that nobody has denied this. Also I know that a lot of uh, independent production companies have been fielding calls from staff who work on shows uh, and a lot of those uh, production companies are having a think about should they be applying for these shows are they going to be up for grabs uh, I mean Chloe uh, you're from Audio UK uh, obviously we don't exactly know what's happening um, but it's a bit unusual is it unusual for people to, to hand back their shows I think it's becoming increasingly usual, if okay. I'm honest. I think, um, obviously, we're talking about something else in theory, as you mm. say. I think something else is notable because if they have done what, what we think they've done, they've handed back a massive suite of shows 
all at once to the mm. BBC. Um, we think it might be around sort of 18 shows about that sort of level. Yeah. And doing some tallying up. Yeah. And I, from, you know, what, what people have said, I think it's all of the BBC pop network, the music network shows rather than the speech network shows. Mm. I mean, it's a huge statement, but for me, it's very... Um, illustrative of um, what's been happening with the BBC over the past few years. A lot of members have been in contact with us and they have either on a much smaller scale given shows back, not gone for shows that have run out at the end of their contracts or they have um, not gone for shows. And obviously in in the kind of wider competitive market, that's hugely problematic because what you can infer from that is that the shows, it's not even about making profit. Those budgets are not big enough for indies to even go for them. And I think the huge issue with that is the BBC is required as part of the charter to um, have some of their output go through a competitive process. And if people can't afford to go through that process, then they're not getting the best ideas. They're not kind of supporting the industry. And I think it's really sad it's something that we've talked to them about for a long long time um is that chickens coming home to roost a little i think so yeah i mean budget so obviously i talk to a lot of members a lot of the time it's worth saying we obviously represent Mm. people who make content for everyone it's not just the bbc Mm. but the bbc is a big client um budgets in some cases have stayed the same for five years or reduced people can't afford to pay their staff properly and I think that's a kind of sad state of affairs and I think that it feels like they should be paying more I know times are tough for the BBC but I think they're shooting themselves in the foot because if they're not investing in the creative economy which is production companies then you know the BBC have got tough times coming ahead they want to be making sure that the audio industry is really robust and really profitable and if they're kind of standing in the way of that with a lot of their budgets then I think that's really problematic you know we um we hear that all ships rise an awful lot at the moment (laughs) you want a bigger pie um but how do you get that bigger pie if it's not being invested in Brett used to be a commissioning editor at BBC, but a good, good few years ago. Um, were your budgets always rubbish? Were you mean to those poor super indies? That's a rather answer, <laughs> answer the question. No, I think what's happened is everything's gone up. You know, overheads have gone up, staff costs have gone up, electricity has gone up. You know, everything's gone up, and those margins that people are earning have not necessarily kept pace. If you're an indie, though, that so, like something else, you'll have one producer working across multiple of those shows. So therefore, you can you can make that work. But it is tougher to make a profit if you're making a show that is you know a weekly hour long show the money is in kind of you know the always on shows and we hear that something else may be keeping those speech shows that are weekly and on all the time but making money out of those weekly music shows is is hard to work but also you know I'm, I'm aware that Sony may be you're dropping some of their podcasts and you know a couple of those podcasts I hear about are doing pretty good numbers but the difference between something else net something else then and Sony now is that Sony are clearly raising the level of what they think success and 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 you know profit looks like mm. uh, but also the BBC are in a tough spot it's not like they've got loads of money uh, coming in um, less people are paying their license fee they're facing similar inflationary increases uh, are they as they always are stuck between somewhat a rock and a hard place but this is also caught up and Chloe will know more about this than I do in the you know soon to be emergence of BBC Studios uh, audio um, uh, where they'll be making all audio for commercial operators as well. Yeah, I, th- I think the key thing for me about this, obviously, as Brett says, the BBC sits in two positions here, doesn't it, as the commissioner and studios. I think it's still going through the Ofcom review, but there's soon to be a kind of announcement about it. Sort of compared to telly, audio is like a mess, for want of a better word. You've got all these different oh, don't percentages. Don't worry, telly's a mess as well. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about that later if we want to hear about mess. it. But it's the, you know, some's in-house, some's not in-house, blah, blah, blah. Some people are commissioning stuff of people they manage. And it's like, oh, gosh. Um, and I think that the the main thing for me is thinking about the audio economy in the UK and how do we make that more profitable as a whole. Mm. And I do think that the BBC 
has a role in that in terms of helping to raise those budgets as a whole and they will be feeding into the production houses and production companies that already exist but they also stand to benefit from that you know they're going to be doing a lot more distribution they want to be dominant on a on a global scale and that's not going to work if we don't kind of bring the whole of the UK audio industry up so I, for me I feel like there needs to be a kind of bigger picture around it all rather than like why are you only paying £875 for a two-hour show which mm. is I mean with the best one in the world I don't know if any of you would want to make that show mm. but you can't even pay people for uh, that for us do you look at that well, your tv indie emerging indie do you want to pick up some radio we, I mean, we've done we've done some podcasts for bbc sounds i i started in audio i worked for wise buddha and then a lot of that that work went to something else so i've kind of seen that journey come through and and that was from the days where independent production companies were able to make stuff for the bbc which which when i started was still a bit of a anomaly as a tv indie when we've looked at it and we have looked at pitching into various things including things that the bbc have done when you're looking at pitching into these shows exactly as you say 800 quid for like a two-hour show you're making virtually no margins on that the issue i think isn't just though the inflationary pressures and paying staff etc the actual opportunities to monetize it in different ways i.e you have to go into their studios and make it out of their studios so you can get no drawdown from using their studios you have no relationship with the talent because all the talent is signed directly to the bbc so there's nothing that you can do much there you can't really syndicate it to other countries um it's not like podcasts where you can own the brand and then and maybe do a live event or maybe do you don't have any of that so literally it is from where I've seen it from, and there may be other companies that have found smarter ways of doing it, but it just feels like a transactional relationship of going, you know, you are a producer gun for hire, you do that, you deliver it, that's it. And from a TV space, the reason why the TV indie market has worked is because we get secondary rights, we get to do the format in other countries, we get to get drawdown on cameras and on studios, mm -hmm. etc. And all of those things means that it's not just about the straight budget and margin of delivering that two-hour block. It's about all of the ancillary places you can build a business as well we have just struggled to understand why when you're not doing it at massive volume you can build a business out of the back of it as an indie and and so we do it because our main business is in tv and video and when we come across an audio opportunity that we think is really exciting and fits with our brand we want to get involved uh, nothing would make me happier than doing a pop culture music show for a, a network like radio one or six music or radio two but I don't really know how I can make that work as a business. And, you know, it needs to be a it needs to be a symbiotic relationship. You know, we know that we can make great content for the BBC, but can we do it at the numbers and the long term margins that, that they're offering? I mean, Chloe, some of it is a little bit old fashioned in the way that commissioning works. And, you know, in the past, I've made stuff for the BBC and, and we had like a good go for a couple of years at really trying to build up uh, some production. And we knew what we had to do, which was basically spend a year bidding for things which we knew we wouldn't win uh, to befriend all of the commissioners. So they understood who we were, uh, then gradually scale up what, what we do, bring in some people that they know, try and prove that we wouldn't ruin their networks, get some documentaries of which you make no money on uh, with the gamble that you hope at some point that will then uh, pay out in getting a weekly strand and that's not me it's being a little bit facetious but that's basically how you do it isn't it yeah that that's basically how you do it I mean I, I feel like I have to give a shout out to the BBC <laughs> <laughs> yeah who I love dearly but have yeah there are you know issues um, how, how much did they've, they've fortunate because for so many years they were yeah. the only person you could go to yeah. to buy your wares yeah so the monopoly but now obviously that's not the case yeah. they're still a massive a massive uh, part of that world they are. I'm, I'm i'm always not sure if they've realized how much competition they're facing no and you know we're negotiating new terms of trade with them at the moment and have been doing for quite some time as i'm sure people will be aware and that is a lot of that is conversations about the commercial world. You know, they've done things like they've started the Indie Development Fund in audio now, mm. um, which is, I think, 250 grand a year to kind of support new and emerging indies. But I think they just make it really difficult because, as you say, it's that process. They expect a huge amount of experience for very low budgets. And there's so many caveats, you know, like I, I use Radio 1 as an example because I know them best. Mm you cannot bid as an indie for Radio 1 daytime programmes, which are the high-budget programmes. So 
we're constantly told, oh, but we don't have enough money, the licence fee and da da da. I kind of don't believe that because the money sits there, but the kind of external production houses don't have access to that because the BBC decided they didn't, you know, want to let those daytime programmes out for a myriad of reasons. But I just think they sort of go, you know, I'll come to the dinner party, but actually we're not going to make it that easy for mm. you to eat the food or, you know, anything like that. It's frustrating because it feels like they're making the budget so small that the easiest way to do it will be to make it all in-house. But I think there's another way that still allows indies mm. to go for them and have bigger budgets. Brett, um, I, I was speaking to uh, an indie this week and we were talking about the difference between radio and podcasting and their sort of corporate clients or just other other productions and they were basically saying that the podcast producer rate is much higher than the radio rate uh, so he said it's a slightly strange situation where the network bbc network producers are the more junior end and the more senior people are now at the podcast end that seems quite strange yes and that's a that's an effect of the podcast gold rush if that makes mm. sense and people just perceiving that there's more there's more money to be had in podcasts, but I also think it's it's different skill sets. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I think certainly the, making a radio show is not the same as making a podcast. And you know, and I've worked with radio producers who wanted to go off and make a podcast, and actually realised they didn't know how to make a podcast. They just made half an hour, you know, of something that then sounded like the breakfast show. So I think there are different skill sets, and I think that you know certainly when we when we started the course at city one of the things we heard from the podcast industry is it's quite hard to find multi-skilled podcast producers who can make the show and understand all of the other stuff how to launch stuff social media you know all the other parts of the business you need to know and therefore because there is sort of you know a bit of a a, um, a seller's market at the moment actually it's quite costing more to hire a, a top podcast producer than perhaps a top radio producer uh, stick around i've got more on telly and ai after this hello it's anne from radio TechCon. radio TechCon is the uk radio and audio industry's technical and engineering event and it's happening on monday the 27th of november at iet london savoy place Radio TechCon is the place to be if you love all things audio, radio, podcasting, technology, engineering, or you just want to know about the future of the media industry and where we're all headed. Tickets and information are available at radiotechcon.com and we hope to see you there. Over in the commercial arm of the BBC, BBC Studios have acquired Channel 4's own acquisition boss, double acquisition there, Nick Lee. He replaces Caroline Stone. Uh, it's in drama and comedy. Um, for us, lots of changes at BBC Studios uh, and lots of investment too. Uh, are we now going to start seeing uh, where the money's going? Well, they like they feel like one of the most confident places. I mean, obviously they are the commercial part of the BBC, but like as a brand, they are really making waves, and I think that they see themselves as a as as a real big player. There's there's obviously like a, a few massive players in the content space. You know, Fremantle or Three Media, which is up for sale at the moment, um, and and now BBC Studios are, have very much risen to to the top of that pile. Um, so this this is you know really interesting news. We kind of spoke earlier about how the BBC are getting into audio as well. Um, I think that they are really well placed to to just be a really strong content production company. And actually, if you look at the market right now, that's where it's leaning. It's like there are there are production companies that focus on one thing, like television or like audio, etc. But actually, the ones that are being successful are able to kind of move into lots of different spaces and uh, and and grow where the market takes them and and you know we just spoke about Netflix as well that market is changing again places like BBC Studios feel like they're very well kind of developed and primed to take advantage of where the market goes next and is it just because they're a scale business and they've just got a lot of good people they've got access to cash and they can do I think, big things I think all of that I, I, I you know I just with you know, a bit of professional jealousy maybe but you know when you're looking at something like BBC Studios because they inherited all legacy shows from BBC in house they have that cash flow pipeline and and that's that's kind of really helped secure the ship very very early on so they can start thinking elsewhere you know there are challenges that bbc studio have had you know the top gear debacle continues to rumble on and that's a big hole in in the bbc's particularly international distribution portfolio and and there you know there, there have been a few challenges where they've not won as many shows in say music or spaces where there has been growth in with other production companies they are putting a lot out there and they're being very punchy they've made some big hires recently and this, this is one of them i think what's curious about this is is they've taken an acquisitions person and channel four have had some 
decent acquisitions. You know, he's he's brought in Wreck and Morty. Handmaiden's Tale was a very, very big deal. You know, these, these are all shows that arguably have been one of the few defining things in the Channel 4 slate. I, I don't exactly know how his role is going to work, but if they can bring that intel in understanding how well shows sell and travel, so he looks at their slate and kind of goes, well, this is a great, you know, a great one to... To, to get out to the market across the world, then that's really, really valuable information if you want to continue to scale a business. Because the reality is, the world that we're living in right now, it's not about the domestic market anymore because of all the challenges we have with TV in the UK. It's actually about how we can take these brands and, and push them out to the rest of the world. Uh, Chloe, before the break, we were talking, obviously, about audio and the BBC. Do you think there's, there's nerves about the size of the BBC's kind of commercial competition now for things that... Uh, indie sort of thought was kind of their their zone I guess it from a kind of um, trade body point of view one of our biggest concerns is that the the BBC will come out and um, similarly to how they did it in telly kind of they'll bring out I can't remember how many staff it is in the press release like 80 staff or something and so you've you know you're talking about super indies joking with something else but you're effectively putting that down in the market and they've obviously been recruiting for a director of audio for studios like this is serious this is not no one's messing around with this you know when we obviously it's something that we talk to them about and it's very much like oh there's nothing to worry about and it's kind of like how is that nothing to worry about which is obviously a kind of concern and something that we've kind of openly flagged I'll be interested to see what Ofcom say. I think, you know, my gut is that they'll kind of go, sure, it's fine. <laughs> it's not gonna it's not gonna be a problem. I don't see how it cannot be a problem, if I'm honest. I just don't. But again, I think, you know, they've got a real opportunity to boost the industry and, and my hope is that they do that. I think what would be a real shame is if they come out into this industry that a lot of different really talented independent production houses have built up over the past 20 or 30 years and you know go out and destroy a lot of their business by competing with them for audible contracts or I guess let's say Spotify at the moment different things like that I think if it's kind of generating your own IP and selling that and increasing UK exports and increasing the UK as a place that people want to come to for really good audio because we've got fantastic heritage in terms of production skills then that's great but I don't quite know if that will happen yet. So Brett you've worked for the BBC and outside of it Um, you've seen some of the harsh commercial lights in the last couple of years um, do you think the BBC have got what it takes to to take take on the world and become a, a big, super massive uh, indie production house? In terms of audio, no, in, in everything, in, in telly and in video. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, audio is obviously my area. And if you look at what NPR have done, I mean, NPR have built a business within their studios area where they're making sort of seventy million dollars a year running a commercial audio business, but within NPR, if that makes sense, by monetizing their podcasts and content. And that's clearly what the BBC are looking at and thinking, well, you know, we have the values, we have the people, we have the staff, we can do that as well. And that's really important to the BBC, both in terms of audio and television, in light of the fact that at some point we're going to be in a situation where we're looking at what is the future of the license fee. And you know, how is the BBC going to be funded going forward because the license fee in its current form from everything we understand is probably not going to continue to exist forever so all of these things are about you know how can the bbc make more money to to be sustainable in the future for for us is there a danger that sort of international or commercial shows sort of wag the dog on what ends up on domestic and on um public service sorry i'm just laughing because i'm I'm enjoying the idea of the bbc tote bag like is there (laughs) there going to be like our version of the npr tote bag where the bbc try to basically make their audio model work based on selling selling some swag i i so, Only if you go for the full sixty exactly. nine a month. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, like we've all just spoken about how challenging audio is. Like you know, from a commercial point of view, I I, I think the fact is that, that they've obviously looked at it and seen that there is a commercial reason to do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be making these. On, on the TV side, in this huge growth everywhere for, for BBC Studios, both in kind of redevelopment. I'm not. Shows well, genuinely, I'm not. Shows. I'm not completely convinced there is. I, I would argue that you know we spoke earlier about the gold rush of the the podcast industry. Mm. That was similar to the gold rush of the high the high end 
drama industry that we had. Uh, I don't know if they happened at the same time, or, but certainly mm. they, you know, one has waned. But I would argue that people are still looking for for really good quality podcasts. But the prestige, yeah, and and so I think that there is there is still a market out there. What I, and again, I don't know how this deal shapes out, and I don't know if this is going to be the next movement to going what you were talking about earlier around 100% competition. So what they will do is that they will take out Kitchen Cabinet and Front Row and all of these shows that are like a really iconic to um to the to the BBC audience and then you know look to see if they can make them work internationally. I mean if you look at what happened with Popmaster, mm. I think Popmaster continues to be something that's a really interesting case study for the BBC. If BBC Studios had that, I would argue that they would have done what has now happened with that brand, look at a TV show, so look this at is, a board this game. Is, this is Popmaster on more for um, and on it's great, it's on it's radio. radio and they, yeah, and they're doing some self- you go into Warstones and there's like Popmaster stuff yeah. everywhere none of that happened when it was in house at the BBC mm. now arguably that's a missed opportunity both for the BBC and for the audience so if they can do the same you know with the kitchen cabinet cookbook and with the you know but, it, it feels like there is commercial opportunity but is there. this why they're bringing in these new people because actually the existing people are great at making shows but not creating businesses I, I, uh, the short answer to that is I don't know the long answer to that is Gardner's Question Time is a really big deal for mm. a very, very loyal audience, and they will probably pay lots of money for all of the ancillary things you can have around it. So that's what BBC Studios' job is, and they ha- haven't necessarily... I don't, I don't see a lot of stuff in the market that are based around BBC Audio brands, mm. but what I do see is a lot of really engaged, highly loyal o- audiences who listen to those those things. You know, like the Archers. Like We never see anything about the Archers outside of what's on Radio 4. But you can automatically imagine that there's there's loads to be done there mm. that they've just never they've never been able to, to to kind of get commercial revenue from. I think that's probably a good thing. Well, maybe what they need to do is pump some of these ideas into ChatGPT because uh, here over in AI Corner, uh, a number of publishers have been blocking their content to AI projects like ChatGPT and Google's Bard as the bots begin to use real-time data. Uh, the BBC published a blog uh, yesterday about uh, their own blog. Did any of you see this? So they're just saying that... Um, they're excited about AI and are thinking about how they would use it, uh, but they are concerned about the ethical issues, legal and copyright challenges, and significant risks around misinformation and bias. And as part of that, um, uh, ChatGPT and their friends cannot spider the BBC's website and take all their content and shove it uh, into, into their database. They're right to do that, aren't they, Chloe? Oh, gosh. I mean, what a question. We actually had an Audio Train uh, webinar yesterday with Cliff Fluitt on AI and the future of audio, which was really interesting. Um, I think that we kind of just have to get on and use it. There's all kinds of opportunity with it. I've The quote, sorry, the quote that I pulled out, which I'm sure you've all heard, is that it's not AI that will take your job. It's someone who knows how to use it. And obviously that's not necessarily relevant here, but I think that just, it perhaps it makes sense in this, but just going, we're not going to use it, does not make sense because everyone's going to use it. I mean, Brett, that, there is, if you're a big uh, IP company um, lots of people are finding out that their IP has been somehow subsumed into ChatGPT and I don't think ChatGPT knows exactly where it's got all of the data that's inside it are the BBC right to, to put a stop like other broadcasters and other platforms on well, uh, if, you're, if you're a commercial company you know, the New York Times I think were the first mm. to do this and the Chicago Tribune and you're building your business uh, on a subscription basis by getting people either to subscribe digitally or subscribe to your newspaper and put your journalism behind a paywall you don't want that upended by it being, being scraped by a chat D- GPT and given away somewhere else. But is it the ultimate public service, the BBC uh, or a public broadcaster, giving their content to chat GPT to, to, to get rid of mis- and disinformation? But then it's no longer on your platform when you haven't got control of Should it and people matter? are not coming to the BBC. Should that matter? You're giving the BBC a hard time <laughs> this week. What have they done to upset you <laughs> this week, man? I think, but I think that that's a relevant point because I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, again, I don't, I don't know, I haven't seen a balance sheet of the BBC. That would be a fun little podcast. I think they need to be investing much, much more heavily and I say this as a producer, so, you know, I might be shooting myself in the foot here, but they need to be investing much, much more heavily into AI. You know, the reason that TikTok is such a massive platform that's grown so quickly is their ability to use AI to understand what their users want to see. Like, the iPlayer needs to be doing that as a, you know, as a, as 
point one, and then you start getting into going, well, if if the BBC create a large language model, like Google have, like Microsoft and ChatGPT have, that could be a really valuable public service. There is something in that 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 I think that, you know, when you look at the public good of the internet, like Wikipedia, etc., this is where the BBC could be doing something really, really interesting based on the whole heritage of their archive that they have. One of the things that I hear a lot of criticism around the BBC is that the, there's not enough of the different parts being joined up. You know, we go back to Popmaster. Mm. Had the TV part of the BBC be talking to the radio part of the BBC, that situation would never have arisen where they lost that brand and it went elsewhere. But I think that if they if they use this sort of model of going, well, hang on a minute, we've got all of these assets. They're now all sitting on both BBC Sounds and iPlayer, which I understand doesn't talk to each other anyway for the back end. That all of these incentives are there to kind of go, well, somebody else is going to do it, so we may as well do it first. And I do think that if they do it right, there is a really good public service value in this that I think would be useful to combat disinformation, would be useful to kind of celebrate British culture and and kind of help us understand where we're going next, as well as the audience figure out what stuff they should be listening to and watching. But there is a big, there is a, a long history of broadcasting organisations and media companies seeing something as a threat before they realise it's an opportunity. Yeah, but the, but the one place that they didn't do that you know, and this is the Greg Dyke's legacy, is with the iPlayer. You know, Greg Dyke was one of the very first to understand that actually streaming video was going to be a really, really big thing. That's why they invested early into iPlayer. And now that's been the whole thing that, they, that the BBC is based around. If they're able to do the same here, where they kind of go, well, look, ChatGPT is not necessarily for us, but we are going to start pulling this together into our own large, large language model just to see what this looks like. That could be a more interesting story because it creates a, a public intervention in what is a very scary AI story. Right I was now. on a, a research roundtable call the other day. I don't know why I got invited. I think I was there to notionally talk about the audio end. A lot of TV broadcasters from around the world that were on it. And they were all being asked about their, their views on AI or how they're using it in their, in their organizations. Uh, what do they think they're going to do? And there was a real split. There were some companies who are all in right now and are doing loads of stuff that isn't really kind of talked about way ahead of, of, of what you see in the papers. And there's the other half, similar sized companies who are like, oh, we're experimenting a bit and, and we're seeing. And I think everyone on the call was a bit like, wow, the other side are in a very different place mm. to me. Uh, and it seems to be one of the fastest changing bits of technology that I've seen over, over the last few years. One of the stats we had in the webinar was around how quickly people had kind of signed up. And I can't remember, it was mm. getting up to X million or X billion users. And it was something like Instagram was nine months to get to that. TikTok was six months. ChatGPT is two months. And it's I just think it's moving so quickly and you just... I, you just have to get on it. I think you have the worst thing is to go no or at least go no, but actually be getting on it behind the scenes. Uh, the only thing I would just quickly want to say around that is, you know, that feels like an, an analogy to what's happened with threats. There, there is this kind of phenomenon of the doors opening, everyone rushing to sign up, looking at the platform and kind of going, oh, what do I do with this? I, I think I think the, the AI stuff is, is different to that. Um, personally, though, I, th I think Threads has is going to be the one. Okay. It is going to be the one. So, of course, everyone passes. I feel like I've gone about six months to, to like a, an episode of the media podcast six months ago. I, 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 everyone passes in and then it drops off. But I think um, I mean, on social, everyone's gone a million different directions. I think what's interesting with, with AI is that everyone's gone, right, okay, existing large language models like the, the, the chat GPT ones. And then there's like, oh, what have we got internally? You know, what is our own uh, large language model? So, if you use Adobe Photoshop with some quite good AI stuff, that's all trained on their own yeah. licensed material. I think Getty doing something similar around there, and material. that's what that's what i think I, that's what mm. i'm saying so the chat gpt stuff is interesting because people are signing up to it but where it becomes for me more interesting is with i think it's called sidecar or sidepod whatever they're doing with microsoft office mm. whatever they are you know google bard is kind of part of that because google search is a product and then they're integrating it into there i do think firefly and what adobe are doing is one of the more interesting spaces because you're actually got a user that understands how to use have, have opened up photoshop to do something and then are using ai to ask it to do something more that's where it becomes really really interesting chat gpt to me feels like a shorthand for ai yes. like it's become the, the verb that we use to talk about about ai but really what we need to be seeing is people like the bbc kind of going well, what's our version of google which is what we talked about previously and now going well, what's our version of chat gpt that has a value to the end user and then we can kind of start seeing some interesting products. Uh, well, until uh, AI uh, can solve this problem, I'm afraid all of you have to play the media quiz, uh, which this week is entitled Friend or Foe.
Uh, I'm going to give you two media brands in the news this week. Uh, you just tell me whether they're currently friends or foes. And of course, the reason why. Uh, buzz in with your names if you know the answer. So Faraz, you will say... Faraz. Chloe. Chloe. And Brett. Brett. Right, here we go. Question number one. Friends or foes? The Sun and the Daily Mail. Chloe. Chloe. Friends. Why are they friends? They're friends because they are joining together to print their newspapers at the same place. They are. They're not inserting one into the other. They are still separate <laughs> newspapers. Uh, but yes, they're going to save money by shutting down some printing operations and printing together. Uh, right. Question number two. Spotify and Audible. Friends. No, foes. Oh. Foes. Definitely right. foes. 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 You've got to buzz in with your name. Sorry. Brett. Still wrong. Too excited. Go on, Brett. Oh, um, foes. I mean, Spotify have entered the audiobook market in a really big way they launched a while back and now they've sort of signed deals with all the major publishers there's a lot of really interesting things about this deal i mean firstly the publishing industry have never really seen audiobooks as a primary platform they've always seen it as like an, an add-on and i think what this will do with spotify entering in such a big way is it means they'll they'll bring a whole new generation of, of people who have not listened to audiobooks before to the table who will begin to see audiobooks content and the publishing industry has also been pretty poor around data they've always only really been interested in sales data mm. and sort of a you know, number of people buying their books n less so about who those people are and i think spotify will give them a huge amount of data so they can see exactly who the customers are for their books and also uh, help them curate their offering better what's odd about it though is the publishing industry have been so slow mm. and you know they had an opportunity here you know to over the last few years to build their own distribution platform well, the, the, and to own audiobooks no, and they've never done that there's no like all you can eat audiobooks no. platform and they're because they are very keen on making sure you pay for those audiobooks so you in audible land you get your credit and what can i use my credit on this week spotify have gone a different angle haven't they they've gone 50 you get 15 hours free as part of your deal and then what happens when you get halfway through a book do you then stump up some more cash is there an extra subscription? I presume you don't have to actually buy books because that will be the revenue model for the publishers. But it's the other thing that's interesting about it, aside from the fact you know that they've not never invested in their own platform, is the fact that this has broken the Audible monopoly. Mm. You know, the publishers have been sort of in hot to Audible mm. for a long time, and that means that other people can now enter the market. So if this is successful for Spotify they won't be the only two players in this area. We'll see other people starting to break in. Just as a sidebar on this, I've really, I've always been really curious about why children's, the children's book audiobook market hasn't been broken by this. I, I, well, I, I, well, I saw someone talk about this deal and going, this is great for kids' audiobooks because yeah. they're shorter. And right. so you can get a, but you then get... there's lots of repeat, you know, they mm. listen to it every night, mm. etc. And And I do think that there's a really interesting conversation about how that's going to work because as, as you say it is all about habit forming like once you get into the habit of podcasts once you get into the habit of watching daytime tv whatever it might be it becomes something that you always come back to it's such a massive market kids books uh, it's it doesn't seem to have really cut through i know mean, there's like a there's a device called tony box that have done some really interesting stuff in this space as a hardware property but and I also think Yoto a, Player, right? But yep. they're they're all they're all hardware mm. properties, mm. right? Uh, it, it's interesting that, that both Audible and now Spotify haven't seen that kids the kids market is is a big one for this but space. Kids audio, I find as a whole, is totally underrepresented. Right. Like when you try and look for within, I think some of them are better than others. But in Spotify, it sort of it had Spotify Kids app for a while, and that didn't really work. And then you obviously go through the Spotify screen, but it's not even got a kids section, and that's for podcasts as well as audiobooks, Audible's the same, Apple's the same. And it's, I mean, Matt, you probably know more about yeah, this. What we need is a radio station. So, yeah. <laughs> really fun for the kids. And <laughs> like, yeah. Well, so this, this week, intriguing. this week, Apple Podcasts have introduced a proper kids section into Apple Podcasts. It's taken this week. The Spotify one is a little bit more confused. Yeah. Obviously, the place you go is funkidslive.com slash podcasts, uh, available, available on all of your apps of choice. Um, but no, I think it's a very underexploited medium. Uh, I think some of that is driven by discovery. So it'd be interesting, interesting to see what happens. I think this will cause a, I think this will cause a huge amount of change mm. for a, a marketplace in audiobooks that's been dormant for an underexploited for so long. To look at. Anyway, final question. Uh, friend or foe, number three, Greatest Hits Radio and Jack FM. Oh, Faraz. They're, For all they're just not, Faraz. They're not just friends. They're married now, aren't they? Because, like, 
They've j- uh, Jack has now taken Greatest Hits Radio's name in, in matrimony. Well, not- yes, it's hard to know whether they are truly friends or foes. Oh, okay, because, fine. Because, uh, Greatest well, they Hits- are married then. Yes, yes. <laughs> so Bauer, Bauer bought the stations in Oxford, and so the two Jack FM stations will be rebranded, Hits Radio and Greatest Hits Radio, uh, next week, I think, after 17 years. So friend or foe? Well, foe, because Jack's going to cease to exist. So, um, you know, they are definitely fans. But surely they're all part Greatest of one... Greatest Hits consumes all before it. That's one part of Happy Bauer family. So they're, of course, friends. But I'm assuming that there are <laughs> presenters and staff at Jack yes. FM who will no longer have this. This is a 10-part podcast. Right. Yeah. Uh, more, more on that next week. Uh, and uh, I think everybody's got a point. Uh, so we'll ask AI to adjudicate the winner. Can we use our point and like subscribe you, to an audio book? You like, can use your Audible <laughs> credit or your Spotify 15 hours. But on not that. a whole audio book. Uh, thank you all. Uh, before we go, how can people keep up with you for us and what you um, do? God, that's a good question because everything changes, isn't it? So I'm um, not on the threads. company is, is Gold underscore Walla. Um, I am Faraz, like everywhere else. I don't really use Twitter anymore. Mm. Like I and I just yeah. But you could just find me. You just ping me a note. Call um, me. Send me a letter. And what are you making at the moment? We are just fi- we're in the edit of a um, a fashion documentary um, about black culture's influence on British fashion, which is looking really lovely and has got some incredible names in it. Um, and and then to be honest. You know, we haven't really spoken about this, but just trying to survive now. It's a dark mm. time for TV, mm. um, as it is for all content. So we are chatting to lots of people, and hopefully the next time I'm here, we'll be with lots of great news about lots of great commissions where well, we've employed lots of great people. There might be some radio shows on the horizon That'd too. Nice uh, to Chloe, uh, how can people follow you in Audio UK? Uh, so Audio UK, you can just Google us. Um, I had to check myself there that I wasn't <laughs> on the BBC and had to put it into a search engine or something. <laughs> Thankfully, no. Uh, yeah, Google us. So we are... Uh, trade association for production businesses and we provide business support and growth for people who make podcasts radio and audiobooks please come and join us if you're a business that does so we have loads of great resources and support um I am still sort of on Twitter, although it feels like a sort of hostile gentleman's club (laughs) when I go into it now. So I'll be on threads more soon. Um, And yeah, you can find me there or drop me an email. Uh, Uh, And I'm I'm Bwetesar on X and Insta (laughs) and um, threads and anywhere else. Any TikToks yet? No, I'm I'm on TikTok, (laughs) but I've never made one. It won't surprise you to hear the world doesn't need that. (laughs) And how can people see what you're up to at City University? Um, follow us on city, uh, city Journalism on X is the best work, the best place. Great. Uh, thank you all for your time today. And that's it from us today at the London Podcast Studios. Remember, you can get 25% off your first booking when you use the code MEDIAPOD at thelondonpodcaststudios.com. That's MEDIAPOD at thelondonpodcaststudios.com for 25% off. And if you like what we do, please share this episode with your colleagues. Uh, We're on X, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, where we're at The Media Podcast. Uh, And there's a whole treasure trove of bonus and extended interviews over at patreon.com slash mediapod, uh, where you can donate to support the production of the show it would be really appreciated patreon.com slash mediapod my name is matt deegan the producer was ollie peart uh, with support from matt hill it was a rethink audio production i'll see you next week Music.